I'll be reading uh, this morning from uh, the first chapter of the Gospel of John. If you would turn there now, you can find this on page 886. If you're using the Bibles in front of you, when you found John chapter 1, would you please stand for the reading of God's holy word? I'll be reading uh, for us this morning verses 1 through 5, and then we'll skip down to verse 14, which will be uh, much of our focus this morning. Uh, Hear now uh, the word of our God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. May God add His blessing on this, the reading of His holy Word. Please be seated. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming, it came. (laughs) Somehow or other it came just the same, and the Grinch with his Grinch feet ice cold in the snow stood puzzling and puzzling, how could it be so? It came without ribbons, it came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags, and he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas perhaps means a little bit more. Probably know some of those words. (laughs) Um, Our theme this morning is rather predictable, even if it's still profound. Uh, What is Christmas all about? I'll even break it down for you into two questions. Uh, Gospel fellowship. Who is Christmas all about? Jesus. Jesus, thank you. Christmas is about Jesus. Uh, And what happened on that first Christmas day? Jesus was born. Jesus was born. Very good. That's, That's our basic outline this morning. Who Christmas is all about and what happened on that first Christmas day. Now, as we come to the Gospel of John... And the words that we just read, we very quickly uh, are thrown right into the deep end. (laughs) John doesn't waste any time here. In fact, even if we try to skip down to the Christmas text, the word became flesh. It's as though John has a footnote when he says the word and he says, go back to verse one. You can't skip this. Uh, This is who... Christmas is all about the Word who was with God and was God. It's interesting that John uses his language of the Word. It's as though he's trying to go all the way back to the beginning. He even says that in the beginning was the Word. Going back to the beginning, to the early chapters of the Bible, to the first chapter in the Bible, and actually one step further back, uh, right behind even the first thing that we see in the scriptures. You remember how the scriptures open. In the beginning, God created. John says, in the beginning, not first what's something, something that God does, but in the beginning was. This is before God even acts in creation, before even the very things that we read in the very opening words of the scriptures. In the beginning, God created. This is over our heads. <laughs> Just as we begin looking at this, how does John describe him? He says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. It's an interesting phrasing that John uses here. Uh, To say that the Word was with God gives a sense of, on one hand, association, uh, being in the company with God. Um, uh, If you were to ask me uh, what I did yesterday... 
Well, I'd probably tell you a little bit about what we did in the morning and opening presents with my girls. Uh, but then later in the day, we were with my in-laws. Now, I don't have to tell you very much, but simply saying I was with my in-laws, you can fill in all the gaps as to what that was, and you have a sense that we shared something with them, probably around a table. <coughs> we're with my in-laws. It's that kind of sense of, of association. But saying with also presumes a kind of distinction, doesn't it? Um, if I tell you last week I was with a friend, uh, you know intuitively that the friend I'm referring to is not myself. <laughs> I was with a friend. Both of these things are true of the word. When we ask this question, who is Christmas all about? Those are things we have to deal with. The word who was with God and was God. Well, let's think about what it means to say that he is on one hand associated with God. God. Well, there are two categories of all things that exist. Um, in, in one column, it's everything that has been made. This is you, your parents, your grandparents, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, anything, any sort of gifts that you had yesterday or meals that you shared, uh, the, the, the trees and the birds, everything uh, in this world that we would see, even, even unseen, invisible realities. Heaven itself is something that is made. The angels, these are things that are made. All of these things are in one column. And in the other column is God. God alone, the one true God. Uh, the Word, John tells us, who was with God, he was God. He is in this side, on this column, he was God. Listen to how the scriptures also speak of him. Colossians 1.16 says this, by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is God over and against all other things that he has made. He's not only the creator, but he's also the sustainer. He upholds all things. Hebrews 1.3 says this, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. This is something he's doing even now as we speak, as we've gathered together what holds things together and even brings them to their end. He does. Paul in Romans 9, an amazing uh, just quick turn of phrase, he refers to Christ. He says this, that he is God over all, blessed forever. And then later in Romans 11 says, From him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Surely this refers to the Word. The whole Trinity, yes, but also to him as himself God. Who is the Word? Uh, the Word was God, not only in relation to creation, but also in relation to God himself. That's one of the amazing things that John says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And as soon as you consider Him in relation to God, we're brought here. He was God. He was with God, and He was God. Now let me take a step back from the text just for a quick moment and speak in some uh, more theological terms. Uh, we believe in one God who exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Um, how, how does their godness relate? That was one of the, 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 the key questions that the church had to clarify and be uh, sure of over and against opposition. How does the godness of the Son relate to the godness of the Father? Well, not only is their godness equivalent but their godness is identical. Uh, these three are one and the same God. Uh, the Father is the one true God. The Son is the one true God. The Spirit is the one true God. There is one God. 
The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word, as John says, associates with God as himself the one true God. That's his point. Uh, but we can't get around the fact that John, uh, John affirms this in such a way that presumes some kind of a distinction. Remember uh, the illustration before. I was with a friend last week. My friend is not me. <laughs> Uh, I was uh, with a friend. You understand some kind of a distinction where what John says the word was with God. He presumes a real distinction between the word and God, but in a way that's different from my example about me and my friend. It's in such a way that John is still led to say next that the word was God. He holds both of those things Together Now, theologians will make this point, and, and you, don't, you don't have to remember this, but maybe tuck it back uh, in the back of your mind uh, as, a, as a helpful distinction. Uh, theologians make this point that there is a real distinction between the persons in the Godhead. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Father. These aren't just masks we're talking about. There is a real distinction between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but there is not a real distinction between person and and essence, person, and being in God. The Son simply is God. The Father is the one true God, so also the Spirit, the one and the same God. Back to verse 14 of John 1. John says, The Word became flesh. He is calling to mind everything that we have just talked about. He's calling this to mind. He's saying that who became flesh? The Word who is a distinct person in God, who is himself God. John is reminding us of who this is in terms of the full depths of his being a distinct divine person and the one true God, whether or not you fully comprehend him because you can't. And neither can I. Who is Christmas about? The Word, who in the beginning was with God and was God. Now, I need to make a brief uh, comment on some of the ways that John speaks here before we move on to consider what then happened on Christmas Day. Uh, you've noticed I've repeated, just as John has said in, in John 1, that the Word was God and the Word was with God. And John's using the word was in a way that's a little bit different from somehow sometimes we often use it. Um, uh, if I ask you, are you a bus driver? And you respond to me, well, I was. What are you implying? At one point you were, but you're not anymore. <laughs> that, that's, how, that's how we do that oftentimes. When we use the word was, sometimes we imply a distinction between what now is and what used to be. But John is doing something different here. John, when he says the word was God, what he's doing is he is, he is saying that, that the context of everything that he is saying is where? In the beginning. Uh, prior to, apart from, with or without, no thanks to anything that comes in all of creation. Um, over and against it is not dependent upon what anything comes. It is not altered or changed or diminished in any sense uh, by anything that happens in this world or that follows in the history of this world. That's what he's doing. He's saying these are things that are true in the beginning. And when John says these things, uh, that the word was God, because he was God, he therefore is and will be God into eternity. Things that do not change, they are not altered in any sense. With that in mind, here's what John, how John describes what happens then on uh, that first Christmas day, what we reflect upon and remember, John 1.14, the Word became flesh. The Word who was with God and was God in the beginning, the Word became flesh. What came to be was flesh. What came to be was flesh. Everything uh, uh, is referring to everything from the point of conception even to his birth. What came to be was flesh. 
Um, now that in itself, uh, thinking about a child coming into the world is a profound reality, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's, it's one of the most marvelous things that takes place in this world. A child coming into the world, all, all of the joy, uh, the anticipation, the, uh, the, the emotions, the relief, all, all of those things were present when Christ was born. A child coming into this world, it's, it's hard to compare it to, to anything else uh, in, in this life. Uh, but John's point is, is not simply to highlight the marvel of a child in general. Uh, John does not merely point out that flesh became, but he says the word became. The word became flesh. The word who was with God and was God, he became flesh. And notice he doesn't say God became flesh. Uh, he's not trying to say that in some ways uh, his godness turned into something as though that were even possible. Uh, his godness does not turn into anything other than what it was. It cannot be altered or diminished by anything in this creation or anything that takes place. Already made that point. John has made this point by saying he was with God and was God. His godness does not become something. John's point is different. He's not trying to say what became flesh, but identifying who became flesh. The Word. All that came to be was ordinary flesh, but this becoming was anything but ordinary because it is the Word who became flesh who was with God and was God. There's, there's a resonance in this verse with something that, uh, that, that John had already said in verse 3. And I want to read for you what the King James Version says because it's a little bit easier to see in, this, in that translation. King James in, uh, first, uh, in John 1 verse 3, it says this, All things were made by him. And then in verse 14, And the word was made by him. Flesh. Notice how the same word is used. Uh, in the language that's translated, it's the same word and it's the same form of the word that's used there. Uh, we could say all things became through him and the word became flesh. Uh, what, what John says, uh, the very thing that distinguishes creation from the word in, voice, in verse 3 John now speaks about the Word himself in verse 4. The Word became flesh. All that came to be was flesh, but it was still the Word who became flesh. Now John gives a helpful description for us of what, that actually resu what results from that. When he says in verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And John has a very particular image in mind here. When he says that the word dwelt among us, and before I explain what that image is, I want to give just a little bit of a warning, uh, because the, the, the kind of image that, that John is wanting to remind us of is something that can very easily be, be taken out of context and twisted uh, to misunderstand what John, is, what John is saying or doing here. He has a very specific purpose in mind. Uh, he says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You see that in verse 14. He dwelt among us, so that John is not wanting the, the image that he's using here, he's not wanting to describe somehow how the human and divine natures re, in Christ relate to one another. He's wanting to, to teach us, to give us under, an understanding of how it is that the incarnate word relates to us. That's his point. He's not giving an analogy for how it is that the incarnation is possible. He's giving us language to understand what the incarnation means. How does the incarnate word relate to us? He says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. When he uses the word dwelt or to dwell, he's alluding to the idea of a tent. That's the word that's translated just as a, a kind of illustration. We have something very similar in our own language. Uh, when we say uh, that we want to house someone, we have to house someone. To house someone is to give, is to give them a, uh, to provide shelter or, or perhaps a place to live. And when you hear the verb to house, 
You can't help but think of what? A house. <laughs> Especially when you read it, because it's right there. It's the same kind of thing in the Greek word that's translated. Uh, the word became flesh and tented among us. Pitched his tent among us. Uh, and there's a particular tent that John has in mind. The tabernacle, if you recall from the Old Testament. The tabernacle was a tent. The tabernacle was a kind of covering that God had commanded his people to make so that he might dwell in the midst of his people. And when the tabernacle was first constructed and made in, Ex in, in Exodus 40, it says this, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. That's the tent that he's talking about, that he wants us to remember. The tent of, uh, in which the glory of the Lord filled, that he might dwell with his people. Now John has probably a number of things he wants us to consider, but there's at least two that I want you to notice now. Why John uses this image of how it is that the incarnate word relates to us. The first is this, when you think of a tent or would look on a tent, you're confronted with very ordinary materials. <laughs> Very ordinary things. Uh, in the Old Testament, the tent was made with, with wood, uh, various kinds of metal and fabric and, and animal skins. Uh, when the people would see the tent and see the tabernacle, they would recognize many of the same kind of materials that their own tents were made out of. That's what they saw, very ordinary things. So also with Christ, in, in this child who's born, you're confronted with what is the very ordinary stuff of creation. You recognize a human being uh, made like us. You can see him without being struck blind. <laughs> uh, they could hear his voice without being broken by the thunder of it. Uh, it was possible for Jesus Christ uh, to pass someone by and for them to never even know he was there. Uh, confronted with, with very ordinary flesh, ordinary human nature. They would recognize him as human. At the same time, in the tabernacle, you're confronted with the dwelling place of one who has divine glory and majesty. To whom all worship, honor, tribute, and obedience is due. Even have this in the Old Testament, where as the tabernacle was set up, you have the camp is set up around it because this is the focal point of their entire lives and worship at this point. Everything focused and centered around this place. What you see is that which is made, but who you see is the maker of all. What you see is flesh, but who you see is the word made flesh. Now let me repeat this because this is important before we... Begin to draw this to a close. We have to get this right. Who they saw was the Word made flesh. What they saw was flesh. So it's amazing then that John speaks this way. Listen in verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. We have seen his glory. Now we've talked about glory so far, or at least alluded to it so far in the sermon. Uh, it's been hard to avoid because of who it is that we're talking about is the word who was with God and was God. Uh, and the divine glory that is his from the beginning into eternity. Uh, Jesus even uses uh, the word glory uh, to refer to that same thing in John 17 in his high priestly prayer as he, as he refers to the, uh, speaking to the Father, he refers to the glory as he says that I had with you before the world existed as one who was with God and was God in the beginning. Uh, we've spoken about glory in terms of the divine glory that, that filled the tabernacle as that was a tent that was to cover the glory, the, the glory of one the full, uh, whose full shining not even Moses himself could see or behold, uh, whose glory that at, at times in the Old Testament when it broke out from that place, it came in, in judgment 
It was, a, it was a terrifying thing to behold and seen, and, and John has, has been maybe a little bit more restrained than, than, than I've been able to be in his use of the word glory. He has reserved the use of the word glory until now. This, this is the first place where John uses the word glory in his book. And it's not with reference to the glory of what his flesh hides or conceals. But when John speaks of glory, he speaks of what his flesh is. We have seen his glory. Uh, what they saw was a very ordinary child, a newborn child. It's marvelous to see a newborn baby. There's something in us that, that just kind of uh, almost melts when we see a child and can hold a, a baby in our arms. And, and if you tell me tomorrow that you, that you were holding a newborn baby, it'd probably bring a smile to my face because there's something wonderful about it. But in terms of what we expect to see in this world, there's also something very ordinary and regular, as marvelous as it is. But to see this child is to see his glory. Uh, later in the Gospel of John, uh, the disciples and many others um, would see him suffer and die. You've probably seen many other people suffer and die. Uh, you've probably seen uh, people suffer and die in a fallen world as grievous as it is. Uh, to see people die is still a very ordinary thing. But to see this man die is to see glory. When he's raised from the dead, uh, they, they, uh, they examine his hands and his side, and they'd seen hands and side and even touched hands and sides before, but to, but to reach out and to touch this man and to see him is to see glory. It's amazing. John, uh, in the Gospel of John later on, uh, he uses uh, the, the language of him being uh, uh, put upon the cross as, as, though it's were, as though it were his exaltation. He was lifted up, he says, multiple times. Is a time for, for those around him to see his glory. John says, we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, on one hand, it's true that whatever the Word assumes or takes to himself is glory simply because of who he is. But it also reveals something, and that's John's point. It shows something about him, almost as though, almost as though there is a, a room that is full of light and you have a beam of light that is shining through a keyhole. Where it shows something and you can see something. What is revealed is this, that you are looking upon one, the Son himself, who is full of grace and truth. Full of grace as himself the life that he gives to sinners. Full of truth as the only one who reveals the Father who has sent His Son into the world to save sinners. Uh, for the Son simply to come into the world sets in motion everything that is necessary to bring grace and truth to you. And that's what John recognizes. That this is no ordinary thing that has just taken place. As much as what you see is ordinary flesh, to have the Word become and to take to Himself ordinary flesh is to set into motion what cannot be stopped because the Son is full of grace and truth. And we'll see that grace and truth is brought to sinners by His own death and resurrection and giving of the life that is in Himself to people like us. That's what Christmas is all about. When the Word became flesh and what was seen was the Son of God, one who is full of grace and truth for the sake of His people.